Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much for coming to the EA Festival this morning. Um, I'm delighted to welcome William Seacart to our festival tent. William probably needs very little introduction to most of you. Nearly 30 years ago, he created the Forward Prizes for the best new poetry in UK and Ireland. He founded National Poetry Day, which has engaged millions of people across the country in live events and performances. In 2012, he seized the opportunity provided by the London Olympics to carve inspiring verse into the walls and stadia of Stratford. Um, but he's probably best known for his two poetry pharmacy anthologies filled with poetic prescriptions for ailments as diverse as emotional repression, unrequited love, and pushy parenting. <laughs> his work has been described by Stephen Fry as a matchless compound of hug, tonic, and kiss. William, welcome to the EA Festival. Hello, thank you very much for having me. So I thought this morning our conversation would um, uh, hopefully allow William to read some of his favourite poems aloud and allow the poetry to speak for itself. And we'll have a bit of time at the end for questions, so do please uh, get your thinking hats on for that. So William, um, it's obviously exciting, thrilling to be part of a live cultural event after so long in lockdown. It's quite strange, isn't it? <laughs> it's very exciting, very exciting, just to be in a place with so many people again. And I, I suppose one of the silver linings of the COVID cloud is that poetry has, has enjoyed a, a something of a renaissance. Um, why do you think that is? Um, well, I might be picky and say Renaissance is a bit unfair on poetry, but uh, it's been around a while. Um, I, I actually think poetry before COVID um, was booming and poetry sales have gone up, I think, 50%, something like that, in the past four or five years. And that's to do with social media. Um, poetry is a very little world, or was a very little world, and uh, in commercial terms it's a very little world because there were only maybe half a dozen publishing companies that regularly would publish new poetry in the UK. And so the funnel, it was very narrow. And um, most of those poetry editors were white, middle-aged, middle-class men. And so they have not necessarily similar tastes, but maybe you know, an, a narrower spectrum than the, than the broadest of spectra. And, and then social media came along. And then, as a result, people were able to promote all kinds of poetry that they liked or that they wrote. And suddenly we had a very different kind of um, set of voices, which actually is fantastically exciting. Um, but then on top of all of that, COVID. And, um, you know, uh, I, I put on my email address in the, in the back of the two pharmacy books. And during lockdown, I've been very, very, very busy hmm. um, because I've realized just how bonkers we've all become. And um, uh, I was saying just before, actually, that um, from the beginning of this year, whenever I've done a Zoom call with anyone on their own, I, I've begun it with a kind of, you know, like you would, how, how are you? And a supplementary question, how's your mental health? And <laughs> out it's poured. And nobody has said, I'm fine. And whether they're 8 or 80, they're having a very challenging time. And it made me think, actually, if I'd asked that question a year or two earlier in life, people would have probably been quite offended. Uh, or thought, who do you think you are? Or, I'm all right, I'm fine. Um, but actually, we live in very strange times. And I think that we haven't been able to commune with each other, plainly, physically. But that also, that communing is a spiritual uh, side to it as well. And we haven't been able to commune and celebrate together the texts that maybe we were raised on or cared about or found helpful. So in some ways, I think the canon of poetry has become a kind of secular liturgy that we've been sharing with each other through lockdown, through some very, very difficult moments. And um, have people approached you with, with particular ailments? And, and what, what, have you, um, what have you been able to prescribe to help people get through lockdown? Is there a particular poem that's helped them? Or? Well, I think the ailments of lockdown are, are fundamentally no different than the ailments that we all, uh, humanity, has always had. But they've been quite concentrated. Mm. And I suppose the, I think one of the most powerful uh, um, prescriptions I've ever discovered is a two-liner by 
Hafiz, which, which is for loneliness. And mm. loneliness in lockdown has been more exacerbated than probably anything. And Hafiz wrote 700 years ago, something like that. I wish I could show you when you're lonely or in darkness, the astonishing light of your own being. And I've always just found that to be a sort of miraculous two-liner to give to people feeling anguished and lonely. And um, mm. I always suggest to them that they learn it off by heart. Um, the number of times I've seen people sort of seem to get out of the chair a foot taller mm. uh, when they've taken that away with them. It's so simple. And um, I had an amazing email once from, from a lady who said, you won't remember me, but um, you met me in the... In, a, in actually a mental health unit in Liverpool many years ago and you gave me those two lines and you told me to stick it on my mirror and last night I came home and my flat had been burgled and in that horrible way that burglars do, you know, everything had been disturbed. She said, except for those two lines which were still on my mirror. Mm. Thank you, she said. They got me through the night. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And um, poetry is often a... Um um, a therapy or, a, or possibly even a cure for the people that have approached you. Can, can it also be a, a prophylactic in the sense that you can, you can prepare yourself for the, the day ahead or the challenges ahead? And, and did you self-medicate with, with poetry uh, during the pandemic? Yes, I did self-medicate with poetry. Um, the pandemic began for me uh, at a time of great grief because I'd lost, just lost my mother. And... I had the most extraordinary moment. I was trying to dismantle her possessions in the way that's very painful and very anguishing. Mm. And I think the thing I found hardest was um, dismantling her library and the mm. idea that somebody had collated and collected a lifetime's worth of books and readings and learning and that all that care that had gone in it would just be mm. put into boxes and just end up in a second-hand bookshop. just didn't seem... Right. Anyway, I'm fiddling through, feeling a bit sort of soppy, and I suddenly find a very slim volume takes my eye, and I pull it out, and it's a folio edition of the Four Quartets. And my mum had taken me, I think it must have been in the 90s or 80s, to a West End production of the Four Quartets, which uh, Josephine Hart put on, with Edward Fox, Michael Goff, and Eileen Atkins. And it was astounding. And... We went out to supper afterwards, and I couldn't. Neither of us could speak. We were so overwhelmed by what we'd heard. Anyway, in order to do my grieving, I think, I started learning the four quartets. And uh, I, I, I began to understand why people wore black armbands and, you know, that sense of, I don't want to say I'm fine, or I don't want to say or forget it ever happened, well, you know, if you're out socialising, or any of those sorts of things, mm. you want this thing to say, I've been through something pretty immense, and if you don't want to engage on the subject, you know, you don't have to come near me, as you might say. Um, and my wife, who's a documentary filmmaker, uh, had years ago made a film about a Carmelite uh, order of nuns who don't speak, but um, they meditate, and every day they meditated on the text of the four quartets, which I found... Yes utterly intriguing. And I found this whole text more and more intriguing the more I sort of invested in it. You know, when you learn something off by heart, you really inhabit a text. And it's a difficult text, as, as you probably know. But uh, therefore, the revelations that started to come from it were absolutely gripping. And I'd find myself in conversation with people. And suddenly, a little passage of this extraordinary lengthy poem would come through my head in a really explanatory and, and helpful way. And one of the conversations I was having with somebody not that long ago was about the dif difficulty of accepting as you grow old that you don't become wise. And, <laughs> um, and Eliot says in this poem, do not tell me about the wisdom of old men, but of their folly, their fear of fear and of frenzy and of possession, of belonging to another, or to others, or to God. The only wisdom we can hope to attain is humility. Humility is endless. Says it all, doesn't it? And that lengthy, lengthy 
I only learnt the first 700 lines off by heart. Uh, 14, you know, I was halfway <laughs> through, but I feel now I've absorbed some really important and useful things. So that is self-medication during grief. Mm, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, your, your poetry pharmacy anthologies of 2017 and 2019 have been enormously successful. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, William is available to sign copies of these outside afterwards. So do please uh, buy up. Um, and, th and they've been particularly successful in your achieving your mission of getting poetry out of Poetry Corner. Um, are you planning a third volume? Um, I'm hoping to uh, start a third volume this autumn. <coughs> I've been a bit busy with a couple of other projects, but right. yes, I, I, I've always thought of it as a trilogy. And um, by putting an email address in the back of the book, I've been sent an awful lot of suggestions that people have come across, some of which are absolutely marvellous. And then people also write to me and go, what about sibling rivalry? Or whatever it would be. So um, I found a few more conditions that maybe need addressing. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, is there a poem you could give us a sneak preview of from this, this, um, this uh, new edition? Or, or from, perhaps what, from the new pharmacy? Or, yes. Or um, not on hand because it's not in any of the books, so no. I, I, I don't. But um, or perhaps is it is it um, uh, something related to you, you mentioned sibling rivalry and um, um, it, it, is there something about children? I mean, we all have children and grandchildren. What is the? Yeah, yeah, I definitely got something for that. Actually, I, I, I've had a real treat in lockdown. I mean, we all had a very difficult time, but um, I was commissioned to make two anthologies just before lockdown started. So every time I was feeling, oh no, what? Or, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's the same old day again. I think, well, I, I've got to go and look up some poems. I've got to go and find an, an interesting poem. So I've spent the last two years reading poetry. And I really mean last two years reading poetry. I haven't read a novel in two years, which I've, I've never been in that situation in my life. So, but uh, in particular, I've been making an anthology for children, a sort of poetry pharmacy for children. And that's been an absolute treat because I've been exploring both the old and the new from all over the world and uh, I found a wonderful poem which I've begun the book with because it's really for um, this poem is really for parents and grandparents or carers is it in there yeah it might be in there. Um, yeah here it is thank you and I thought that this is a really appropriate um, poem I've used it in this book and for uh, the condition pushy parenting. Um, it's by William Martin. Do not ask your children to strive for extraordinary lives. Such striving may seem admirable, but it is the way of foolishness. Help them instead to find the wonder and the marvel of an ordinary life. Show them the joy of tasting tomatoes, apples and pears, Show them how to cry when pets and people die. Show them the infinite pleasure in the touch of a hand and make the ordinary come alive for them. The extraordinary will take care of itself. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, the, the pandemic has uh, accelerated the use of digital technology um, and in fact, we're live streaming this event um, today. So welcome to everyone who's watching this online as well. Um, you mentioned that uh, social media had brought new voices uh, to, to poetry and brought new audiences to poetry. Um, and you founded the Forward Prize for New Poetry. Are there any new poems or poets you've encountered through the Forward Prize that have challenged or surprised you? Every year. Every year. I mean, the great thing about poetry is it's quite hard to define what poetry is. And people often say to me, you know, what's your definition of a poem and all that kind of stuff? And I go, well, w whatever connects to you, really. Um, uh, I, every year something new pops up. I, I think poetry is sort of on the front line above anything, any other art form. It, it deals with issues before any other art form does, in part because 
it's instant. You can just get your pen out, or sorry, this day, is a day and age, the keyboard. But you know, it, you don't need investment. You don't need an orchestra. You don't need a troupe. You don't need a theatre. You don't need the oil paints or the canvas or whatever it would be. You can just do it. It's accessible. And what's interesting is the poets get there first. Mm. The very, very first forward prize was won by Tom Gunn. I don't know if you, any, any of you remember Tom Gunn. Tom Gunn, uh, great poet of the, it's first published in the, in the 1950s, uh, died in the 90s, uh, I think. And he wrote an extraordinary book called The Man with Night Sweats. Tom Gunn was gay, he lived in San Francisco, and this was the first mention of AIDS in any art form. Mm -hmm. And Lament, the title poem from the book, which is about a man dying of AIDS in hospital, uh, is one of the most moving poems you will ever, ever read. And this was years before Lady Di was out there shaking hands and so forth. And I think that's what I find so exciting. I've just made um, an anthology called Poems of the Decade, which is coming out in October, so it's a sort of synthesis of the last 10 years of the forward books of poetry. And um, everything's there. The refugees, the wars, the this, the that, it's all there in the here and now. And mm. that's what makes poetry so exciting. Most people's image of poetry isn't of its frontline vibrancy. Mm. But I think that's what gets me up in the morning. Mm. Is there a poem from one of the forward prizes you, you can read of course. us now, William? Of course. Um, that one? That's, that's that lovely poem, Bee Eater, isn't it? Okay, let's, let's read that. This is from this year's forward book of poetry. Um, it's by the poet Pascal Petit, and it's called Green Bee Eater. More precious than all the gems of Jaipur, the green bee eater. If you see one singing, tree, 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 with his space black bill and rufous cap, his robes all shades of emerald, like treetops glimpsed from a plain, his blue cheeks, black eye mask, and the delicate tail streamer like a plume of smoke. You might dream of the forests that once clothed our flying planet. And perhaps his singing is a spell to call our forests back, tree by tree by tree. Well, that's wonderful. My family and I lived in India for a while, and I remember those green bee eaters in Jaipur swooping down onto the pools of water and picking up bugs at dusk. And there's something incredibly light about that poem, yet it addresses such a a heavy issue is deforestation, but in the lightest, most delicate way. But isn't that the charm of poetry? You know, its concision, its ability to glide and move around in a way, in a really unexpected way. Mm. Um, uh, it, th that's, that's what makes it so exciting mm. and so, you know, malleable and playful. And it makes you look at the world in a different way, doesn't it? I mean, you, you go to Jaipur and it's absolutely rammed with with jewellery shops and gem sellers. A noise. A noise. And no one notices the bee eaters. No one thinks no. they're more precious than the, the gems yeah. of Jaipur. But, yes. but this poem changes all that. It's mm. wonderful. Thank you. Um, some of the poems in the Forward Prize are, are, are quite difficult, aren't they? I've, I've, there was one seven-page poem in there about a lady who unfortunately dies in a kayaking accident, which seems to be sort of seven pages of bullet points. And I'm, I'm a bit old-fashioned. I mean, I quite like rhythm, rhyme, and, and meter. But what, what do you think are the essential qualities that distinguish a poem from, say, a piece of chopped-up prose? Hmm. Well, as I say, I think it's kind of subjective. I, I've read some extraordinary bits of prose poetry. I'm sure you all as readers know that feeling when you, you buy a book, let's say a novel, and the first page you're maybe reading slightly too quickly and you think, oh my God, I've got to slow down. This is so beautifully written. I've got to savour every phrase, every twist and turn. This is a bit special. Or that moment you feel when you're reading something so beautifully written, you think, oh, I'm over halfway through. 
you know, it, <laughs> it's it's a it's a real it's um, uh, it's a real treat to be connected to somebody and their writing. And but I also think what's interesting about these things is that it doesn't always happen like that. Looking at the generation um, in the tent with me today, I think it's fair to say you will understand when I tell you my story of saving up for a vinyl album when we were young. It was a big deal. It was a lot of weeks' pocket money. It was jolly expensive. But when it arrived and you got it on the record player, you bought it because there were maybe two songs on the album that you'd heard on Radio 1 or on, seen on Top of the Pops, and they were the kind of chart toppers and everything else. And as you played that album for the first time, on the back of side two would be this really weird song, and you think, God, what's that? <laughs> anyway, once you played that vinyl album over and over and over again, because you'd saved up for it, and that's all you had, and I can hear my mother's voice, life is boring, and you just have to learn to live with it. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that track on side two became your song, didn't it? And amazingly, those two songs that you bought it for, that you'd heard on Top of the Pops, were a bit saccharine or syrupy, and you didn't really want to listen to them anymore. And great art is layered. That's the point. Anything that's easy and straight at you and you appreciate instantly will probably bore you rigid in a week. Um, th what I often say to people is, OK, if that doesn't look like a poem to you or whatever. One, read it aloud. And I, you don't have to read it aloud aloud, but read it aloud in your head. Don't read it like a bit of fiction or mm. a piece of journalism or whatever. Hear it. And then put it down and read it again tomorrow and the next day, and the next day before you go to sleep. Read it three or four nights running, and I bet you'll get something totally different from it each night, and by the end, rather like that difficult track on side two, you'll start to think, oh, that's really interesting. Fantastic. Um, I wanted to ask a question that sort of goes to the heart of what poetry is. What, what is it about it compared to other art forms that gives it such a unique power to connect people across classes, cultures, centuries? Well, after all, it's our language. You know, it's what we speak to each other. It's been part of, as I say, a liturgy for every faith. Um, it's wrapped up with storytelling. It goes back to the pre-written word. Um, it's a synthesis in some way of music and, and words all in one. Mm. Um, it is... In essence, although I do remember in my first job, uh, <coughs> my boss saying, 80% of human communication is body language. Well, I think that's maybe exaggerating, there's, but uh, there's plainly that too. But, you know, it's the most accessible way of us sharing things. We can't all draw, we can't all play musical instruments, mm. you know. Um, and mm. it's part of what begins in our parent-child relationship with books and reading and learning and all of that. So... You've written that poetry is a healing force and, um, uh, and, and creates a sense of complicity with, between the poet and the, and the reader or listener in terms of maybe their suffering. Do you, do you think you need to have suffered yourself in order to understand the suffering of others and to empathise with that? Yes. And you, you come from a family of refugees who fled Vienna during the war. You were locked up in an unloving boarding school. You witnessed a shocking road accident. Is there a moment in your life you return to to, 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 to help you empathise with the people that approach you? Uh, not a moment in my life. I think... Um, uh, but I think that, uh, I've, you know... Um, for one reason or another, had quite a lot of difficulties in my life and mm. had to deal with death a lot very early, um, which was quite an interesting experience in the sense that I realised that because I was one of the first of my generation to have to deal with it, mm. uh, none of the rest of my generation knew how to deal with it and actually were quite frightened of being with somebody who was dealing with it. I don't know whether, I'm sure you've, those of you who've dealt with grief know that odd feeling when people you're very close to are, who haven't had to deal with grief, don't, you know, almost can't bear to be with you because they don't know what to say. And then almost complete strangers who have dealt with grief are suddenly unbelievably helpful mm. um, because they've been through that. Mm. I mean, that's just a, a, a mini version of it. But plainly, 
the more pain and anguish or the more difficulties you've been through, the more likely you are to be able to connect or empathise or mm. understand other people's difficulties. And, you know, um, I haven't had a terribly easy life, so mm. maybe that's... <laughs> There's That's a wonderful helped. poem actually in, in one of your pharmacy books about, about, I think it's called Kindness. Yeah. Which, which sort of explores this idea that, that, that we've just discussed and so beautifully. This is an American poet who's uh, alive and well and uh, writing a lot today. And I've just used her uh, a number of times actually in this children's anthology. I think she's amazing. She's called Naomi Shihab Nye. And this is a poem called Kindness. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment, like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go, so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride thinking the bus will never stop, the passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say it is I you have been looking for and then goes with you everywhere like a shadow or a friend. That's beautiful. Um, I wish we could journey all night on this conversation. There's so much still to ask and still to say, but I've been told it's time for Q&A. So okay. um, if there's anyone with a burning question, we have some um, mics on the left and right side, and William will do his best to answer them. Thank you. Amazing, William. Um, I was really impressed by that incredible poet at President Trump's, no, uh, yes. Mr. Biden's inauguration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, terrible slip of the tongue there. Um, I mean, it's really a question, a sort of global question. I mean, the world is in such a mess at the moment. I thought she was incredibly impressive from the heart, and I, I like that imagery you portray of poetry being such an immediate force of art that you know you hear it it's a very you're very much in the present when people are poets I mean are there fantastic poets coming out of Africa or out of Syria out of Yemen I mean you know tell us tell me a little bit or us a little bit about that because one's not exposed to them really. yes well I, I would say look up uh, shameless plug but look out for the forward book of poetry uh, and this book poems of the decade which is coming out in October um, really interesting the last 10 years of what people, what those vo who those voices are and what they're saying and where they're from. There are a lot of poems about, as I say, Syria, Iraq, relocation, trying to start a new life in a different place, all that kind of stuff. And if you remember the moment when Salman Rushdie won the Booker Prize and how that opened all kinds of doors and then it was Michael Andarchi and then it was Peter Carey and then it was... Um, um, I've forgotten her name from Canada anyway, on it went, suddenly, all the global voices writing in the English language were winning these prizes. Well, the Forward Prize, which is the Poetry Prize, coming up to its 30th anniversary this year, 
the last eight, I think, have been won by Trinidadians, Jamaicans, people from Brooklyn, people from all over. And it's gripping. It's absolutely fascinating. And it shows again, in a way, how interesting and malleable and flexible the English language is. Anyone else? Oh, yes, two here at the front. Uh, I wondered, um, we heard that you, um, your family came from Vienna. Yeah. And I wondered whether you, well, I assume you're bilingual and whether you're influenced uh, at all by German poetry. Well, I have a very complicated relationship because my father um, told us all not to learn, learn a word of German. And uh, the expression bloody Huns was used quite a lot in my upbringing. And um, so uh, uh, I, I did a, a Radio 3 programme last year, a thing called Private Passions, where they ask you to choose your favourite classical music. And I realised the only bit of Vienna that had come with him really was his taste in music. And I'd been raised on Mendelssohn and Schubert and so forth. And that was the only thing we were allowed, really, and Wiener Schnitzel. Um, <laughs> and I had this really bizarre experience last week when um, two years ago the German government decided that they were going to um, make reparations to any refugees or families who'd had to leave. And my paternal grandfather was from Berlin. And um, so th they, they offered um, citizenship. And my siblings and I and all of our children, in the moment of Brexit, thought this would be quite a nice opportunity to take, take up. So last week I went to pick up my naturalisation certificate and I turned up in um, London at the place where all passports and things happen for the Germans and they said, oh, no, 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 for this you're going to the embassy. And I wandered round to the embassy in Belgrave Square and I was taken into this enormous room where there was a very friendly middle-aged woman who made the most extraordinary speech of reparation mm. and I burst into tears mm. I couldn't believe it I thought I was just picking up a certificate but it unlocked something that I've obviously had to kind of put away so yes I do like German poetry very much but I think I haven't really fully investigated my genetic past and my cultural past and probably that's the next bit of my journey mm. <laughs> Talking about language, I'm foreign myself. Um, do you only use English poems, or do you also use poems written in other languages, and are they translated? And mm. how do you capture in another language the meaning and the emotion that somebody is writing in another language? Isn't that interesting? So the answer is yes. I, I mean, in here are poems in translation um, by Japanese, by Persians, uh, by all kinds of poets, but they're only as good as the translator. And it's quite interesting because, for me anyway, I was given Rumi's poetry by a girlfriend in my middle twenties, I suppose, which completely blew me away. I'd never come across Rumi before, and she'd illustrated, done pen and ink illustrations with it, and it was my treasured possession. And, but she bought the, the Rumi, as I discovered later, in New York. And I lost it. And for years, I would keep on buying copies of Rumi as I found them in bookshops. And I always thought, it's not the same. That doesn't do anything for me at all. And it, it turned out that there was a particular Daniel Ladinsky who translated Rumi and Hafiz who brought th these ones to light. But unless I had that edition, I couldn't connect at all. So um, I hope that answers yes. Um, William, you've talked about the concision in poetry. Twitter has a concision about it because of the limit of 142 characters. Is there any poetry in Twitter or anything we can learn? Well, a lot of people use Twitter to, to, to get their, their poetry across. Um, and, you know, if you've got a short enough um, piece of poetry, that's in a way the charm of the power of the Instagram or the Twitter or any of these other feeds that you can put something quite short and pithy on it. Um, and th that, I think, is, 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 in a way, given poetry um, a, an enormous new opportunity um, because, therefore, people can share 
um, these extraordinary bits of poetry with each other. And um, I, I want to just quickly uh, quote you, actually, in all of this, um, the words of Alan Bennett, because I think this just gets it all. The best moments in reading are when you come across something, a thought, a feeling, a way of looking at things, which you thought special and particular to you. Now here it is, set down by someone else, a person you have never met, someone even who is long dead, and it is as if a hand has come out and taken yours. And in social media terms, that's even more immediate. You, you mentioned complicity. To me, the key to all of this is that, and we can start to talk about this in our mental health and in our COVID life, we're all pretty bonkers. We all struggle. We're all children at heart. We're all dealing with, a, with, with a sort of multiple personalities in a way. The wise old person, the frightened little person, the father, the brother, the son, the lover, the, all of these different things, a multiplicity of thoughts really interlocking in seconds at times. And engaging and coping with all of that is quite tricky. And I think what a poem does is give you a complicity for your complexity and make you think, I'm not mad, I'm not alone, I'm not the only one who feels like this. And what's more, someone wrote that 700 years ago, so we've been feeling like that forever. That's the, that's the marvellousness of the power of poetry, I think. Um, hello. One of the things that um, I have found very difficult during uh, lockdown, even though I would describe myself as an agnostic, is the... As, a, as an agnostic. Yes. Is the barring of churches, as in... Uh, Churches have been locked in many cases. And uh, my earliest introduction to poetry was probably the Book of Common Prayer, yeah. which I think has got some stunning prayers, um, which are poems. Um, and I found it interesting when you said that it's a secular liturgy, because to me, I wonder whether COVID and what has gone on uh, has, some people have had to try to replace to an extent the uh, what what their religion has given them or their faith mm. and uh, yeah so i just wondered whether you feel that there is something in um, every religion that appeals to rhythm even in the uh, way that the calendars of religion work there's a rhythm there's a mm. and mm. that there's something poetic in the greatest religions all of them and that maybe we've been missing that Yes, I, there, there is plainly poetry in every liturgy of every faith. I say plainly without having the linguistic skill to discover it myself, but you only have to, you know, um, travel and, you know, I, I, I work a lot in the Arab world where poetry is even more significant in their language than it is to us. Uh, if you go and spend time in places like Bangladesh, you would feel the same. Uh, I, I, I think... Um, uh, I would be amazed if there was a liturgy um, which wasn't poetic, if you see what I mean, to the audience who's raised upon it. Mm. William, we've only got a couple of minutes left, and um, your, your new anthology for children uh, has the title Everyone Sang, and I wondered if you could finish with that wonderful poem by Siegfried Sassoon. This is to cheer us all up. <laughs> uh, do you know what? I'm going to uh, break the rules. And I'm going to read you something different. Perfect. I'll tell you why. Because <laughs> here's a thought to go away with. I think we live more and more in a world where we're tormented by uncertainty. And particularly because of lockdown and what that has meant to us. And being extremely unclear about where, where we might be going or not be going next week, next month, or whatever. Mm. And um, I also noticed that the newspapers are filled with headlines about things that haven't actually happened, but they're enough to torture you with fear about what might happen if they do happen. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a poem for uncertainty, for fear of the unknown, uh, fear of the future, and it's by Sheena Pugh, and it's called What If This Road? 
What if this road, that has held no surprises these many years, decided not to go home after all? What if it could turn left or right with no more ado than a kite tail? What if its tarry skin were like a long, supple bolt of cloth that is shaken and rolled out and takes a new shape from the contours beneath? And if it chose to lay itself down in a new way, around a blind corner, across hills you must climb without knowing what's on the other side, who would not hanker to be going at all risks? Who wants to know a story's end or where a road will go? Thank you. Uh, William, looking around this, this tent, most of us are probably double jabbed for COVID, but thank you for double, double jabbing us with your wonderful <laughs> poetry this morning. My pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, William Seacart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.